Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of BBFOhio.com as we conclude our answer to the question in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, Who goes to the lake of fire? This is part two of two. It's all connected. And you're going to see it get worse. And I believe it will somehow play into the one world government and the mark of the beast and all that. You know, it could be that when you take the mark of the beast, there's something in that chip that takes over your mind. They're already working with that. I've seen uh, about a year ago where you could actually have birth control in a chip that yep. lasts for 16 years and the female could choose to turn it off if she wants to have kids. Yeah. They're working with that already. Yeah. And so all you have to do is have it go to the mind, brain and control. It's amazing. Idolaters. Real quick it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 19 and 20, What say I then? That the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? And there's a lot of people who misconstrue this. They'll say, well, it doesn't mean anything. No, it's not what he's saying. Next verse. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. Whether it's giving money, or in some countries they're still cutting off chicken heads. Believe it or not, they're still killing animals for idols. Yeah, this, this is the month where you'll see it, right at the end of the month, where it'll go on. They sacrifice to devils. Even if you think you're just sacrificing something to a meaningless God or whatever, that's not the case. And by the way, most of your politicians just do this every year, and they just did it a couple of months ago. It's called Bohemian Grove. This right here is a big owl, representation of Moloch. And most of the presidents that have, in the 20th century were basically anointed here. Liars. First John 2.22. What's that? They actually offer a thing they call the sacrifice uh, of care. And they have a, a they say it's a, a it's not a real body and there's some who claim it is a real body that they actually take up there and throw in the fire. But what is this? Uh, I mean, is this just devil worship? Yeah, they it's it's all of our political leaders go out to California in this place called the Bohemian Grove and they carry on and it's all men and to quote Richard Nixon, quote, it's the most faggoty thing I've seen in my life, end quote. <laughs> they have male prostitutes, and, our, and a lot of our politicians are into that. Sodom and Gomorrah. The first female? And they, they, the word I had was, that w what I was told was that they basically um, trucked in Mil Hillary this time, this, this year, secretly. But I haven't seen any hard evidence for that, so I can't say that. But, you know, there ain't much work to be done there. She looks like a man. I mean, <laughs> so maybe no one would really notice. First John 2.22 uh, says, Liars. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. And you say, well, um, you know, anyone who's not a Christian is denying that. Well, in a sense, it's true. But even within Christianity, there's a little word here I want you to pay attention to. What does that say? The. Not a, the. And you've got all kinds of quote unquote preachers who are denying that he's the. Christ, that He's the Son of God. And if you deny He's the Son of God, that's why we're saying John 14, Acts 4.12, fits the study. <laughs> you deny that, you'll go to hell. Amen. amen, amen. Now I want to show you this. The spirit of lies. We've done messages on it. One of them is called A Culture of Lies. I just want to show you a little video clip. These people are Hillary supporters. 
and they don't give a flip about the issues. They just are going to support her no matter what. That's what we were talking about earlier. All this WikiLeaks stuff, ain't gonna, these people, you ain't going to get any of these people on board. Watch what you, they say. What did you think when Hillary Clinton said, I see improved relations with Russia from a position of strength only as possible? I, I agree with Hillary. Hillary Clinton Donald said, Trump said, immigration that. is a privilege and we should not let anyone into this country who doesn't support our communities, all of our communities. Donald Trump. Well, I, I virtually have to agree with that. Hillary said, in order to achieve the American dream, let people keep more money in their pockets and increase after-tax wages. Yes, okay. Um, it's uh, in order that that's a great idea so that we can start to move everybody up and uh, start moving people out of the, the level of poverty. And obviously runs fairly severe contrast to what Donald Trump is proposing. Absolutely. Many of her comments run severe contrast to Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton Donald said, Trump I like the concept of local education. I want to get rid of Common Core. I think Common Core is a disaster. Well, I'm an educator. I'm a school teacher. I think Common Core is a, a, a disaster too. Think about what you just saw. The lies. They, they are living a lie. They just are filled with... A, they're just a big walking lie. They just were given Donald Trump quotes. But because they were told they were from Hillary, they said they agreed with it. <laughs> if they really agreed with that, they're voting for the wrong person. That's right. But you, and then they have other videos where they show yeah, and they may have done that here and just not showed us, but they, the one video I saw where they would tell them that's actually a Donald Trump, Trump quote, and then they would just like, oh, well, I misunderstood what you said. <laughs> I say let's begin. We're actually coming down to the end, but let's look closely at what this does not say in the text. It does not say these people that we read about in verse 8 go to the lake of fire because of what they are. I want you to notice that. Look at the verse again. It says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. But what it doesn't say is that they shall have their part in the lake of fire which burneth with fire because they are these things. Did you get that? And we won't quote, we won't show you the verse, but as it says, 1 Corinthians 6, I believe it says, and of such were some of you. So what's the difference there? Everyone in the lake of fire is unforgiven. See? You, if your sin is not forgiven, you cannot go to heaven. If you're unforgiven, there's only one place to go. Reality check. If you are saved, God no longer sees you as these things, even though you may say, well, it's on my record. Well, if you're saved, it's not on your record. Amen. Human beings will hold it against you, but God won't. Inconceivable. Yes, it is. <laughs> this is the theme of the entire Bible. Amen. God requires justice. This is what the world just don't get. But once met, God extends grace. And see, the world thinks God's justice can be met when they do good works. And that just won't work. <laughs> There's only one way for God's justice to be met. To understand who goes to the lake of fire, we must understand how God deals with sin and sinners. And it's not... The scales where you do so many good works and that outweighs the bad and you go to heaven. That's not true. Turn your Bibles one more time to Exodus if you want. You don't have to, but I would encourage you to. Uh, we're going to show it up here. Exodus 34, verses 5 through 7. Genesis, Exodus, second book in the Old Testament, chapter 34. We're going to start in verse 5. And we'll see the difference. There's a difference made here. And you'll see this throughout Scripture. The difference between forgiveness and guilt. Because we're all guilty. We'll see that in a minute. Look what God said in verse 5. It says, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there. It's about Moses. And proclaimed the name of the Lord. 
Verse 6, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. That's wonderful. Verse 7 says, Keeping mercy for thousands, look at this, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Now, at first glance, it seems almost like contradiction. It says he's keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Why is that? Well, let's answer this question. Who is guilty? I'm glad you asked. James, who is a Jew, writing to the twelve tribes, he tells you that in verse 1 of his book, his little epistle. In chapter 2, verse 10, James says this, read it. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Um, Thomas isn't here, so it's a safe question to ask. Um, raise your hand if you have never broken God's law any time in your entire life. Okay. So, you're all guilty, right? Yes. And I'm guilty. Self-confessed here. All guilty. So, who needs to be forgiven? Paul was a Hebrew and a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He explains in Romans 3.19, Now we know that what things whoever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become what? Guilty before God. See, when you're talking to most people and you're trying to express the truth of the gospel, they begin with this a false premise saying, I'm not guilty. They start with, well, I'm not a bad guy. They start with, well, I've done some bad things, but everybody has. I've, and see there? They're comparing themselves to other human beings. And you've got to stop and say, wait a minute. You have to compare yourself to Jesus Christ. He's the standard. And He has given us the law. And the law tells you the rights and the wrongs. And if you're guilty in one point, you're guilty of all. All are guilty. Amen? Yep. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All. Unless you're a Calvinist, you understand what that means. So how can all have their sins forgiven? First, let's define the term forgive. Because a lot of people don't understand the term. I'm just going to take this from the dictionary here, Webster's 1828, which is based on Scripture. It says, to forgive is to pardon. What's this here? To what? Remit. Remit. And it goes on to say, as an offense or debt, to overlook an offense and to treat the offender as not guilty. Amen. See? Hebrews 9.22 says, the remission of sins comes with the shedding of... Blood says, without shedding blood is no remission. Blood. Now, and I always say this. You think about blood. I mean, if you don't understand blood. <laughs> it's why you're here today. It's why you're able to move around. And it's an amazing thing. Jenny and I are watching this thing. Do you know if you just lose 5% of the uh, water in your blood, you go blind? 11%. You can't speak, you can't hear, you'll be in a coma, and 12% to 15% and you're dead. And that's your blood. It turns to sludge without that water. It can't function. And blood is all over the place. You see, give blood, give blood, give blood. There are people dying today in war zones because there's no blood, no blood to give. Isn't that an amazing thing when you think about it? And without the shedding of blood is no remission. This is why animal blood was shed from Eden to Calvary. Mm -hmm. People look at the Old Testament and say, ah, it's just a bloody mess for a reason. This animal blood was a temporary covering for sin. It's temporary. Why? Well, it's a type. It was 
a picture showing the shedding of blood to forgive sin. Hebrews 10, 4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Why? Because types don't save. <laughs> it was a type, a shadow, a foreshadowing. But it wasn't the actual blood that was needed. But it did provide a covering by faith. It wasn't faith alone, but it wasn't works. It was faith demonstrated with the shedding of blood of an animal, and that then provided a covering for the Old Testament saint. Animal sacrifice was a type of the shed blood of Jesus. Picturing that. But the people who did it, they didn't understand all this. But they simply believed God. They didn't understand it all. They didn't believe how that Christ died for his sins and was buried and rose again according to the Scripture. They didn't know Jesus by name. But they just believed God when he said that this was going to picture what Jesus would do or what the Messiah would come and do. But until Jesus shed his blood, the saved went to paradise, not heaven. And I'm not going to re-preach that. We're coming down to the end of our study. But I want you to just uh, see these other studies for more detail if you haven't seen them already. Uh, Stephen, uh, Brother Stephen Miller, taught two messages, dispensational salvation versus covenant theology. And he also taught the righteousness of God, two parts for each one of them. Those are available online as well as our study a few weeks ago in Ephesians chapters 4, verses 7 to 10, we titled it Jesus in the Lower Parts of the Earth. And you watch all three of those studies, and you can't miss it. And I can't, don't have time to go through all that tonight. But only the blood of Jesus saves. Hebrews 9, 12, read that. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by His own blood, He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Jesus literally went to heaven, entered into the holy place with His blood, and sprinkled it on the mercy seat in heaven. There are actual professing evangelicals who just make that into a big spiritual thing. It doesn't say it's a big spiritual thing. He actually did that. By His own blood He entered into the holy place. Once. No matter what age a sinner lived in, they require forgiveness to avoid the lake of fire. That's the point I want to emphasize tonight. So, who goes to the lake of fire? The unrepentant. That's it. The only people who go to the lake of fire are the unrepentant. It says the fearful, unbelieving. We talked about what each one of those are, but they're still looked at by God as being those things because they will not repent. Their heart is hardened. They are rebellious. They are stiff-necked. And they reject the free offer of salvation. If you will not repent toward God, you cannot be forgiven. Not optional. Paul said his ministry in Acts 20, 21 is testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That's our testimony. should be ours. Calling unbelievers who are sinners who need to be saved to repent toward God with faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. You must repent of what you are. You are a sinner. You are lost. You must repent of what you do. You are a sinner. You do sin. You commit sin because of what you are. And you must repent of what you believe. Well, I don't believe a God of love would throw anybody in the lake of fire. You need to repent or you're going to be there. You either repent or you're going to the lake of fire yourself. And what you think about it doesn't matter. Repent, repent, repent. Right. Why? Christ died for our sins. Paul said, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. According to the Scriptures, this end time apostasy includes a lot of well-meaning people going around saying, Jesus died for your unbelief. No. Your unbelief keeps you from receiving the salvation that God offers. But His death on the cross was to wash your sins away with His own blood. 
Without repentance, there is no faith. I want to go back to this. And it says, He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. By believing that, you are giving testimony that you trust in His victory over sin. When He rose again, He conquered your sin debt. He conquered your death penalty. That's what saves you. And without repentance, there's no faith. Without faith, there's no forgiveness. It's that simple. So who goes to the lake of fire? The unforgiven. And they are so by their own rebellion. Their own unwillingness to repent. The unforgiven shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. If you are washed by the blood of Jesus, read that. If you're washed by the blood of Jesus. It's scary how many people out there preach a bloodless gospel. And some people barely even mention Jesus. They say things like, Would you like to go to heaven? Well, sure. Will you say this prayer with me? Okay. That's not saving anybody. And it may give a very false sense of security that the devil will use to take that person to hell. We're justified by His blood. Romans 5, 9 says, Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Justified by His blood. We are also forgiven through His blood. Ephesians 1, 7, read that. In whom we have redemption through His blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Justified by His blood, forgiveness through redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. And finally, no lake of fire for the forgiven. Revelation 2.11, We're promised, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. That's how you avoid the lake of fire. Next week, we're going to study eternal punishment versus annihilation. Because there's a growing heresy among Christians that says that after this life is over, the great white throne, the unsaved are cast in the lake of fire and they're annihilated and that's the end of their existence. The Bible is going to lay it out very clearly you will live forever. The question is where, not if. We'll come back to that. Have a word of prayer. Father, we thank You for this time in Your Word. I do thank You uh, for these Scriptures that get, make it so clear, even though I may not have. Just pray that everyone took this in. And if need be, take notes, go back and get alone with you and ask you to even clarify it even more for them. Those watching online, those uh, watching the live feed or uh, later on watching the videos and listening to the audio, Lord, I just pray the Holy Spirit would clear up any matters I left unclear. And Lord, uh, may we be motivated to at least give people the opportunity to present the Gospel and give them... That's all we're called to do. That's all you've asked us to do. Help us to understand our calling, our responsibility, and not to go too far and think we're supposed to save people, but to understand you've asked us to preach the gospel to every creature, and that's all you've asked us to do. May we do so as we near the end, as we can see the signs. We look up. We believe you're, the rapture could happen any moment. We're ready. We're, we'd love to go right now. But in the time we remain, Lord, we ask that you embolden us and empower us to do your work with whatever time is left. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I wanted to give that prayer so that we can do Q&A. Ask anything there. Yeah, you going. Well, I was just going to make a comment. I mean, you're saying the thing about how, like, once you're saved, you're not known by that sin. I think that's kind of fascinating how, like, nowadays, there are people who are saying that you can be a gay Christian. Yes. Which... Yeah, you know, and I didn't, I didn't hit on that real hard. I know we kind of, you know, we talked about the abominable, but did you hear what she's saying? 
There are whole quote unquote ministries now geared towards helping gay Christians, quote unquote again, to realize that they can be Christian and remain gay. And one of the people who is is now on board with that used to be one of the leaders in what was called Exodus International, which was geared towards trying to help people out of that lifestyle. Now he's flip-flopped and gone back uh, to the other side. And so uh, that's just an example where, as a Christian, it says, of such were some of you. And uh, we're not to remain in that sin. Yeah, Jim? So... <laughs> Where do they draw the line at? I mean, is it okay to be an adulterer and a child molester and every other wicked sin? Eventually, I think that's where it'll have to go. But you know what? They'll, 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 they're kind of real open to the adultery thing, the child molester thing. They get indignant, saying, "Don't compare what we don't compare my love." That's what they do. Child molestation. That's that's the card they throw down. Listen, uh, you know. That's not love, so <laughs> they can call it what they want, but it's, yeah, lust, <laughs> lust. That's right. Yeah, Jill. Um, when I work on uh, my studies, now it's very, very, very common for people to say, "Oh yeah, I'm uh, engaged and I'm living with this guy," you know, and they just talk about it like it's totally normal, totally wonderful. Yeah. And uh, it's more and more common. Yeah. And, they, you know, and they don't get by with it. I mean, there's such terrible consequences. You know, the STDs that we talked about is one of them. But in that uh, so-called gay community, the domestic violence is about uh, three times as uh, higher than among heterosexuals. The um, disease rate is much higher. A lot of those statistics, if you took the homosexuals out of there, they would go way down. And also suicide. Suicide is very high among um, the so-called gay community. Um, and yeah, we'll give, go in order here. Charlie. I just think it's interesting that um, Columbus is one of the gayest cities, and it's also one of the most obese cities, which I think is because it talks about fullness of bread. Mm-hmm. But I... But the uh, the obese thing um, is one thing that there needs to be some clarity on because the Bible never actually says anything about being obese or fat. It is it is uh, the abuse of the body, which Sodom is. Sodom is an abuse of the body itself. But what it, that's why uh, most of the time you'll see gluttony. Gluttony is what we call bulimia today. Gluttony was eating to the point... I would actually use Charlie's dog, Roxy, as an example. We were talking about the difference between his, his little, cute little Roxy and our cute little Sebi is that if I were to throw a, uh, you know, 20 pounds of steak on the floor, um, Sebi would eat to his full, and then he would walk over and say, well, that was good, come back to you later. Roxy would eat until she was sick, go off and yak it up, and then she'd come back for more. Well, that's gluttony, see? And so being heavy, and I'm, I consider myself heavy, whether obese is the right word, I don't know. But I, and by the way, those body, what do they call them? Body, yeah, the body, uh, there's a word for it. Body mass index. It's a joke. Most people follow those, they would be anorexic, and then you got other problems. But, but um, anyway, a lot of the, um, uh, the, the problem with, you know, obese people isn't related to over, overeating. However, among that gay community, bulimia is a big problem. The reason why, another word he used or phrase is body image. In order to maintain that body image so that they can be attractive,